and welcome to tonight's webinar, the Neural Health Panel for Advanced Practice with Dr. Brandon Brock. My name is Emily Holse, and I'm a marketing coordinator here at Vibrant Labs. And first, I want to go ahead and give an overview of Dr. Brock. So as you can all see, he has quite an extensive education, um, and Dr. Brock is certainly a wealth of knowledge for us. And just to highlight a bit about Dr. Brock, so he is a practitioner in Dallas, Texas, and he holds a doctorate in family nursing practice from Duke University, as well as a doctorate in chiropractic. Um, he has been named Neurology Instructor of the Year five times by various organizations, and he um, has earned his stem cell fellowship from the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Medicine and recently completed Duke's orthopedic residency. I do like to add that Dr. Brock enjoys spending time with his family, traveling, helping his patients, and learning new things to integrate into patient care and student lectures. So now, Dr. Brock, I'm going to have you go ahead and take it over. All right. Okay, well, cool. Well, thanks. I appreciate both of you. You, uh, you guys work so hard. I'm, I'm very happy that I get to speak on this topic. I, I love the field of neurology and neuroscience. And I really like the fact that there's more and more innovative things coming out from multiple companies, just trying to figure out ways that we can solve issues and diagnose things appropriately so that we can treat. And I, I personally think that Vibrant is really at the top of the game because of technology, because of price, and also because of innovation. So that's why I like doing this. This is a really interesting test because it, it really snaps together a lot of pieces with some of the other tests, plus it stands alone. And uh, that's what we're gonna go through. We'll, we'll just kind of skim through this. We're not gonna get into real, real deep neurology. I want people just to kind of understand why some of these things would be useful and then some other tests I think that would be good with it. So here we go. So here's your uh, neural health panel and really, a lot of people are like, why would I do this test? I think that that's one of the questions. And of course, if you are looking at this, you know, cognitive decline is one, memory loss. These more than ataxia. Ataxia, I would definitely say neural zoomer. Uh, same thing with balance problems and uh, same thing with neuropathy, but they will aid in that. And you'll see that the two go really together. Alzheimer's disease for sure is this. And uh, even optical uh, decline because of some of the markers, dementia, um, some of the demyelinating disorders and so forth are, th there's a fine line between the neural zoomer plus, which I talk about quite a bit, and this test, because this test is really measuring levels, the level of this and the level of that, like the levels of, for instance, tau versus antibodies to say something like tau or the level of S100B versus an antibody to S100B. So this test plus the neural zoomer go very good because then you can say, well, are the levels up and is their immune system messed up and we're running the risk of autoimmunity or are there, are, is there autoimmunity and their levels up? And then do they have some other conditions like a lack of my, you know, nutrients and, and so forth? So I really like this because Again, now we're looking at, you know, quantitative data. Um, you know, we're looking at the amount and we're looking at things that are a little bit different than the neural zoomer plus. I think we've all, some of us that have been using these tests long enough wanted to see if we could get some uh, overall amount present so that we could uh, determine if disease was prevalent or at least expected. All right, so... You know, this slide's been all over the place. I've been looking on social media and it's really kind of a cool slide. And, you know, I'll give credit to these folks down here. Um, but if you look at this, here is a gut. And I want everybody to understand a gut barrier is very similar to a blood brain barrier. Okay, so they're both barrier systems. We also have a respiratory barrier system and we also have an, uh, a nasal epithelial barrier. Um, and we have, we have barrier systems all over the place and there's always a way for something to sneak through it and then get into a place that it shouldn't be. So for instance, we have gut, we have 
dysbiosis and gut inflammation and really the immune system can get tilted or we get more immunological factors and TH17 will really promote the component of autoimmunity. And then really right here on the gut lining, you know, we have this um, really SIG A that lines this. And then above that is like a slimy layer we call. And this is where most of our bacteria lives. So this will break down, SIG A will actually, you know, start to show some findings that'll be reactive to maybe some organisms or maybe even some food. But nonetheless, something is causing inflammation and it may get through here. And these microbes become uh, problematic. You can get excitotoxins from food, from preservatives. And one of the tests I really enjoy doing is uh, you know, some of the things that are in food, not necessarily food, we can test that now. So pretty cool stuff. I've been shocked what I've seen. People are putting stuff in their mouth that are just, you know, artificial preservatives and stuff like that. Mycotoxins, we see a ton of, um, and immune cells. And then, you know, pathogenic, um, you know, pathology, cytokines and undigested food, all of these things really create inflammation. Okay. So what we're looking at here now is, okay, the central nervous system, let's just say it's a brain, right? It's either been hit and the barrier has been damaged because of inside the brain out or something out here has eaten its way in. Uh, you know, it's, it's a two-way street really, but the bottom line is it's gonna set off several things. And, and what I want you to remember is there are things in cells that do certain things that if cells die, they spill. And if they start to spill and there's a hole that goes into, let's say, serum, we can measure that and determine, do you have a leaky blood brain barrier? Do you have you know, some sort of trauma? Do we expect to have neuronal damage? I hope everybody sees that. So my goal today is not to give you the function of every single one of these things that we monitor and you know, we measure, but the fact that the intracellular contents that are being spilled because of death and damage. We've got neuroinflammatory disease, maybe because of something out here, or maybe because of something in here. And when we have these things and you have like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and your interleukin-6 levels are going up and TNF-alpha levels are going up and neuroinflammation is going up and excitotoxicity is going up and the cells are exploding in these things like neurofilaments and enolase and you know different types of proteins are coming out, things that we can measure, all right? We have the technology. And because of this, we've gotta be able to determine is, this, is, the, is the brain in an environment after trauma or with inflammation that, and this is really for I mean, I think anybody, whether it be psychiatry or functional neurology or even chiropractic, are, are they in a state neurochemically where I, they can grow? In other words, they can get plasticity. So is there enough, enough brain-derived neurotropic factor? Is there enough specific enolase to make it to where all of these things are going to connect? If they're stimulated, is the brain going to heal? Because if not, maybe there needs to be some other things done before you do what it is that you're trying to do to make the brain more connected, more synaptically functional. Um, and, and I want to just put it in perspective, just so people understand why we're, we're doing these. I think that this, um, if I'm going to speak like from functional medicine, this is a dream because so many people come in and they've got brain fog and they've had head injuries and they want to do some cool stuff. And of course, the functional neurologist and then if you, you've also got people who just do medicine and they want to do things that will help reduce maybe some inflammation and allow the patient to kind of start to wire back together. So it's a good test for all sides of the equation in regards to who, who can use this. This is not really made for one group or another. This is made, depending on how you look at it, it works in many ways. So the inflammation, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, you know, microglia start to, you know, drop things. 
there's also astrocytes that are not up here. They start to drop things. And there's also neurons, they start to drop things. And because of this inflammatory process and because of this intracellular, you know, a lot of people come in and one of their early signs is just brain fog. You know, they're like, I've got brain fog. I feel like I'm in a cloud. I'm a little bit depressed. Sometimes their head will be, will feel hot. Like they have a fever, but they really don't. <clears throat> Sometimes there truly is inflammation. And, and once, you know, macrophages start getting in here and microglial cells start to change, they can attack things that have been released out of these cells and start to make antibodies against them. So if the levels go up, it's not a surprise if it turns into a damp or a debris component and we make a response, it gets phagocytized, goes back down to a lymph node, and then you make a B cell, and then you make antibodies. So that's why I like the, the quantitative test and I like the autoimmunity test put together. So when you look at it, we've got this new test. And you can see up here, we've, you know, we've got um, just some basic nerve growth factors. It, nothing super fancy. These are, but, but this is really great stuff. Like if you don't have enough brain derived neurotrophic factor, then even certain aspects of nutrition are not going to actually give you the kind of brain health that you want. Um, and then we have brain function and neuronal damage. And these are the things that spill out that I talked about. So it spilled out of a cell and now we can measure it and we can say, wow, there's been damage. And as a result of the damage, is it going to heal? Well, I don't know because we don't have a lot of growth factors. And then we have memory associated markers. So we have these alpha beta components of amyloid and amyloid has changed a lot. It used to be just like amyloid caused, you know, oligomers caused amyloid, amyloid caused plaques and somebody, you know, didn't make it. Now we have different ratios of different types of amyloid and we can kind of compare those and say, wow, you know, you, you look like your memory may not be in such good shape and we can make a ratio out of that. And then we have total tau, which again, tau can turn into Alzheimer disease. And tau does not become problematic until it becomes phosphorylated. So the interesting thing is in college football players, if you, you can put uh, different types of tracers and use certain types of software where you can monitor the tau levels. Well, there's tau everywhere, but they don't have any signs of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But once that tau starts to phosphorylate, then it, it turns into a real bad show because you make the tangles, you cause the synaptic connections to go away and you have a problem. So what would be interesting as a research study, I'm always kind of looking for research studies is, you know, looking at tau and then looking at scans and then looking at symptoms and then, you know, kind of doing some comparative things and seeing if they have, you know, do they have enough of these growth factors to bounce back um, and then alpha synuclein is really something that's highly related to some neurodegenerative diseases, but all, you know, we, we basically know about one of the famous ones is Parkinson's disease. Now, here is the good old NeuroZoomer Plus. And so I like looking at this and comparing it to this, because if you, if you look over here, I mean, there's all kinds of cool things, you know, does the immune system, uh, for instance, you know, not like specific, you know, anti, you know, is there anti neuron specific enolase? We're going to measure enolase. Okay. Um, so there's many of these things here. Um, there's also uh, blood brain barrier markers and so forth. And of course, you guys know that I, I really like the infection part here because I think it adds a level that tells us if there's intracerebral or intracranial inflammation or infection, then there's going to be a problem. You can see we can have an antibody to tau, to synuclein, uh, S100B, and all of basically everything on this we can have an antibody to. Okay, so pretty cool stuff. I think they go good together. Now, here is the neurotransmitter test. So it's really neat to be able to say, okay, here's these neurotransmitters that are not working that great and they belong to these cells that are in a certain area that is being attacked 
by autoimmunity and inflammation, and they're either going to recover or they're damaged, or maybe there's memory associated with some of these findings. So now I think we're starting to put a bigger picture together. And then this is just a sample of a micronutrient test, but a lot of people are just nutrient deficient. I've come to find out this test is so amazing. I mean, is it a simple, you know, B vitamin? Is it folate? Is it, this is just one piece of, of the test. There's multiple pages. I just threw this up here as an example, but you know, you can start putting these things together or you could really just kind of subtract this out and, and then put a mycotoxin test causing this or a Lyme test that's causing this or numerous gut tests that's causing this. And I really think that whenever you, these are done, these three things belong together. And then you've got sort of a blank here and you can put in all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, you can put in your own labs, you know, that have to do with immunity that will tell you if, you know, these things are, you know, pretty solid. Or you can put in another vibrant test that will, will go along with what you're thinking clinically. So sometimes these things link together. And I think that that's, and vibrant knows that. And that's why I think that they, they do cluster some of this. So pretty exciting. Uh, to see a lab turning into not just being cutting edge, but putting things together and every month something new is coming out. So pretty soon it'll, it'll be the thing. So now we have nerve growth factors. And if you look up here, I'm just going to highlight that area. And so we have brain derived neurotropic factor and we have specific enolase. So these things are really necessary. You, you look at these, these are neurotropic factors. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to read to you just a little bit, but not too much. Neurotropic factors, right? And they're from the neurotropin family. And a lot of you have seen these, you know, they they try to replicate these things supplementally, but brain-derived neurotropic factor is very, very important. Um, without it, things fall apart, like the hippocampus, the forebrain, the cortex, all of the things that are really vital to memory and your capability to heal and recover. So I think it's, I think it's important to be able to measure it. Um, real quick, exercise is probably the best way to in increase it. A lot of people ask me, how do I improve it? Exercise is probably gonna be your best bet. Exercise within your metabolic limit, don't get metabolic syndrome. I had like two of them today as patients. And it's tough to tell um, somebody that is, a triathlete that they can't work out as much. It becomes sort of an arm wrestle. But Bacopa can be a, a real big one. l serine can help out with some of these other markers that I'll show you down here. Panics, ginseng, and so forth. I really like this because they do give some input in, in regards to what you're going to see. So we'll get back to this stuff down here in, in just a bit. Okay, so here's your neuron-specific enolase. All right. So really, let's just think of it like this. When we look at, let me go back for a second. When we look at these things right here, let me again, pin it. Um, these things right here are going to spill out of a damaged cell. These right here are going to keep a cell from being damaged so nothing spills out. So I hope you guys see why I think the order of it is perfect. So as we go through this and this enolase, all right, so here's your reference down here. And, you know, I, I put a long blurb over here, but really what enolase does, let's just make it simple. Enolase is going to work on a cell and we know this, it's going to give it some sort of ability because it's, it's in the, it's in the growth. It's, 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 it's in the enhancement section of the test. So enolase ultimately is pro growth factor. And what enolase does, if you take all of this really fancy stuff, it, it helps with energy metabolism and various enzymatic activities so that we can have this organization of the cytoskeleton. So if we can have organization of the cytoskeleton, then I can then activate that and it will proliferate, differentiate that's within the cell and migrate. 
So with anal lace, we have a greater possibility of having the intracellular cytoskeletal structure to take one of those neurotransmitters that I just showed you and pump it down an axon and then go to another neuron where hopefully its intracellular enolase is working. So if you see this high, you can say something's happening. The inside of the cell is busting. It doesn't matter. The cell is, it's not doing good. I don't have a good level. I would always look at the next section if this level was low, okay? So these are metabolic uh, pathways. Again, they undergo the intracellular glycolysis and gluconeogenesis metabolic pathways. These are vital for cellular function. That's the reason why we picked this one and brain-derived neurotropic factor. These two are the main ones. And of course, there's many other things that you can put on a test, but this is these two are, are the big ones. So this is a spinal cord injury. That's what SCI stands for. And then we have astrocytes. They're going to get activated. Microglial cells are going to get ticked off. You're going to make a bunch of inflammatory cytokines. So 1B turns into interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, breaks down barriers, TGF beta, and interferons are all going to turn into basically things that will damage a cell, and neuron-specific enolase is going to be released. Now, of course, you can measure this level. But you can also get an immune system that can attack that. And you see that on the neural zoomer. So anyway, B cells also, and you can see this right here, T cells can come over here and start to make autoimmunity to it. So nonetheless, this is significant of neuronal apoptosis or apoptosis. And it's really interesting because now if I see this not being adequate, I want to know what's coming out of that. I want to know if the, if the blood-brain barrier is intact. I also want to know if there's infection, because if there's no trauma, what in the heck is causing this? There's also a lot of genetics that go into this that I won't really go into, but there's a lot of genetics that, that will make it to where these become very, very touchy. Microglial cells become very, very touchy. Certain parts of the cell, including the mitochondria, will break down. All right, so... Really, if you put the genes together with the neurotransmitters, with the autoimmunity, and then with our new, our new panel here, you've, you've got just about everything you need other than imaging. So this is really cool. I mean, this is really not a, a complicated slide. I mean, um, if you look at this and it's there, if, if this is blocked, okay, and as a result, We've got a change in its level. We've got increased death, okay? But if it's being you know, taken up and it's being utilized, then we have a decrease in neuronal death. And the function will tip you know, this way towards you know, doing well. And we won't have as much neural inflammation. Anytime a cell ruptures and you see uh, this right here not being so good, it's, that's you know, one of the problems. There's gonna be neural inflammation. So, just remember when we're looking at levels, what it means. You can come back and reflect on this slide. You want the cell to be sucking this up and using it. So when it's low, you don't have as much neuronal death. When it breaks open and it gets higher, you're going to get neuronal death. Okay. So here's a paper that I found. It's new insights into the role of, because the reason why I, I put this in here is because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, this is only good for, you know, perineoplastic or cancer. You know, these are, you know, antibodies that mean things. And that's in like one or two or 3%. Um, I just <clears throat> got published in the Journal of Neurology on COVID. And one of our antibodies that we look for, somebody had found a patient that had COVID and they had post-COVID neurological symptoms and they found this antibody and they didn't know what it meant because they said it was a, a tumor marker. And I went back and said, well, here's some references. About 97% of the time, it's not a tumor marker and here's what it does. And they published it. They, they didn't even send it back. I mean, it went straight in. So I started looking for some of these things because I was like, well, what else is the literature saying other than just, hey, man, this is, you know, doomsday. 
and they go through and, it, and they say there's an implication here that NSE, expression and activity, and neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration and neuroprotection. And let's say here they're using you know, spinal cord injury and various degenerative diseases is prognostic um, and, and may really demonstrate this. Again, prognosis and severity and what do we expect down the road? So I like this because if you read through it, it's pretty much everything that I just said. And we find that neurodegenerative events, when you have elevation in this, can promote degradation, inflammation, glial proliferation. The glial cells get mad. They make more cytokines. The actin remodels, uh, phagus, uh, macrophages, and microglia tend to get a little bit more phagocytic and ramify and change. And it's a reliable quantitative, and that's why I'm telling you that's what's important is quantitative, specific marker for neuronal injury. Now, I've got a little thing, a little slide here in a minute that shows like, you know, how long after such and such injury do we actually do and look at these numbers. This is really great because if you look at this, you can say, wow, there's, there's an injury and there's blood brain barrier damage and we have to get this down and our neurotropic factors up. Sorry, we have to get neurotropic factors, you know, down uh, and anything that's spilling outside of the neuron, we've got to get it under control if somebody has head injury, plus a lot of other things. But again, here's a, here's a paper. Um, and, you know, this goes, I don't know, this is pretty recent, um, but you can always just highlight this, put it in PubMed, go get the DOI, and then, you know, click it and see. Sometimes there'll be a whole article on there. <clears throat> so brain-derived neurotropic factor, I think everybody's heard of this one. NSE, not as much. But look, aging, well... There you go. Now, Alzheimer's disease is going to mess with brain-derived neurotropic factors. So some of the markers in a minute that I show you will, uh, you know, kind of like say, well, okay, look, I've got brain-derived neurotropic factor that's messed up and I've got signs of Alzheimer's disease. That means you're not going to recover from it and you're going to slide downhill faster. So you could really look at these, put them all together and say, this person's got neurodegeneration and it's going to go quick. Okay. Now, there are genetic polymorphisms. And there's epigenetic components. And really, brain-derived neurotropic factor, LTD is, long, you know, we're looking for somebody to have long-term potentiation, not long, you know, not death. And we don't want apoptosis, we want survival. And we don't want pruning to where there's not connectivity, we want spine connectivity, that's called synaptogenesis. So exercise is your, really your best friend. It does a great job. And I'll also say this, having uh, an appropriate essential fatty acid balance, which is not that easy looking at six to three ratios. An enriched environment, <clears throat> reading, going to school, doing work, studying, listening to a webinar, whatever the case may be. And then this slide says antidepressants, which actually is, is really true because this actually deals with neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters can activate a cell. If you activate a cell and you fire it long enough, it will wire. Now, here's the thing about antidepressants. If you take them for maybe six months and it wires one neuron to another neuron and you exercise, you'll canalize that pathway and it'll stay. But if you don't exercise, the literature shows that once you stop the antidepressant, you're liable to get a loss in that connectivity. So I like to use, if I'm going to use an antidepressant or even a nutrient that is a cofactor for a neurotransmitter, I like to make sure that I'm doing these two things right here so that whatever my scheme is for antidepression per se, it works. There's nothing you can do about aging. We can do some stuff about Alzheimer. You alone, can change a lot of your stress. Believe me, I just did it. Um, and I didn't think I could, but I did. And all of this is part of our performance. So brain-derived neurotropic factor and you know specific enolase, these guys have to be there or else the inside of the cell is not gonna be stable. 
And what brain derived neurotropic factor does is once you stimulate a cell, that cell says, thanks, I love you. Let me stimulate you back. And it says, thanks, I love you. And then it goes back and they go back and forth until you are forming a pathway that is now plastic. It's the basis of plasticity. So this is really cool stuff. We've got to have the internal architecture to make sure this happens. And the contents of this cannot spill out and be floating around because if that happens, you're going to tag it as a damp or a PAMP. And if it's a PAMP, it's a pathogen. Damp is just debris. Okay. So I hope everybody's kind of following this just a little bit. Now, this is really interesting because I wanted to throw this in because we have rage antibodies and so forth. And so there's hyperglycemia and dementia. And age, S100B, which I'll show you here in a little bit, amyloid plaques and all this stuff. Brain-derived neurotropic factor, it decreases rage expression. So if there's antibodies to this, we really don't know if it turns it up, turns it down, or does nothing. Sometimes it may do one or something else. But we know that we've got to get brain-derived neurotropic factor over here to help regulate it. Because if not, all of this stuff is going to come over here and drop our neurotropic factors down. And we have to have this so that cells will survive because we don't get mitosis of neurons. And so we have to keep them. And that synaptic plasticity through having the intracellular, you know, sort of connectivity has to be there. We've got to stop neural inflammation because if we don't, it makes the cell excitotoxic. Calcium will leak in and it will blow up and the contents will spill out and we can measure it. And then we have to have endothelial nitric oxide. This is what I really enjoy. Brain-derived neurotropic factor. So exercise with something like venpocetin or venpocetin along with like some endocalyx. And now you have good blood flow. It helps brain-derived neurotropic factor, which makes it to where you do not lose your gray matter as fast. So that's really... And I'm trying to give you just some simple strategies just for yourself. I mean, you, you know, these can obviously get more detailed um, with your patients. But at the end of the day, we do not want these receptors activating NF-kappa B, which is the genetic sort of kickstart to interleukin-1B and inflammation. And the kinase pathway is, of course, a breakdown. So oxidative stress, inflammation, and vascular damage. If we don't have brain-derived neurotropic factor, it's going to allow certain receptors that are getting nailed by various things to create impaired cerebral microvessels and synaptic plasticity. And we've even seen it to the point of edema. Okay. And when that happens, cerebrovascular dysfunction and cognitive decline. We've seen recent infections, which I won't name, uh, create intracranial edema, and it's because there's, it almost looks like a whirlwind going through the brain, and it's causing massive inflammation, and we're having so many of these signalers that it's allowing things to spill out, and we're getting edema. It's getting edematous. So now we're wondering if it's, you know, there's certain drugs and stuff like that that will be beneficial at certain times. So anyway, I've drawn all over the slide, but I think you guys can get the picture, okay? So looking at this, this is really cool. Um, this is exercise again. Endocannabinoid, I know everybody's wild about that right now, okay? We're looking at things that can increase brain-derived neurotropic factor hydroxybutyrate. We give actually IVs of some of this stuff. Anyway, so the endocannabinoid system, you know, CBD, exercise, different types of butyrates, having good hormones will do things like make brain-derived neurotropic factor. And so now we make things like dopamine or serotonin, or we create neuroplasticity. So the size, the strength, the survivability all becomes really good, especially volumizing the hippocampus and that improves memory, cognition, and learning. 
So please don't skip out on your exercise. I'm not telling you to go start ramping up the cannabinoids if you don't want, but make sure your hormones are good. Make sure your body mass index is appropriate. Make sure that your fat is not causing inflammation and make sure you're exercising. And if not, I would suggest you fix it because you need this in order to not get what we call a shrunken brain or cerebral volume loss, okay? So when you have all this, you've got the neural protection that you need and <clears throat> you'll end up making melatonin. So at night you'll sleep good. Your inflammation will go down. Your brain will start to recover. And overall, things like depression, mood improvement and so forth will get much better. So this right here, think if you can measure it. If you can measure it and then you do something and then you remeasure it, you can say, I just gave your brain the ability to connect. Now let's do something to connect it. And I think that's been a huge, I really, when I looked at this test, I kind of couldn't believe it because I was like, this is a huge missing link in the world of rehabilitation. It doesn't matter what your degree is, whether you're PT, DC, OT, whatever. If you're doing something and you're trying to get a brain, you know, there's a lot of people that come in and say, well, you're never going to walk again or think again or talk again. But maybe if you measured some of these, you know, neurotropic factors, enolases, you might be able to say, you know what, they've got a chance to kind of recover. They've got at least the neurotropic factors to make plasticity. Maybe we need to do a few other things, of course. You never know how things are going to turn out, but maybe it'll give you a different outlook. And especially those people that have mild traumatic brain injury, if they don't have good growth factors, uh, then basically you're going to have a very difficult time with your therapy. And I hate to see anybody in the neurological world or medical world or functional medicine world doing treatment and it just wasting the patient's money and time. Okay. So cool slide. Um, sorry, I got drawings all over this, but you know, depression, again, these are all things that can kind of screw it up. No endocannabinoids. I don't use tryptophan. I personally think that tryptophan is uh, an inflammatory product. I use 5-HTP. Um, but if you have bad neurons, all your neurotransmitters go down, your cortisol goes up, your hormones go down, oxidative stress goes way up, cells blow up, cytokines and reactive oxygen species, your brain-derived neurotropic factor goes down, and you don't get any neurogenesis. So really, really interesting stuff. When we start looking at things like depression, we can give a pill that can work with the synaptic cleft of the neuron. But what about all of the other things that might be going on with the person? I think that what's happened is we've started treating some of these conditions from the end and that's it. So give an SSRI, but don't go back, you know, a couple of steps and maybe help that person with, you know, just their brain from dying from oxidative stress and maybe give some cofactors and, you know, whatever the case may be, just tell, you know, some exercise. It's become a world where the average medical visit is probably about eight minutes very easy to give a drug, very difficult to ask a story and find out every single thing after you've measured it and you're counseling the patient in a lab review about what this means. So you know, that's why people have to choose what kind of practice they, they have. So now we've looked at the growth factors. Um, one of the things that I want to look at is just, you know, what if we have damage? So remember, I told you that each one of these things right here whether you know it be fibrillary, S100, neurofilament light, these are all things doing things inside the cell. But if the cell is damaged, of course, these guys will change too. But these guys will spill sometimes through the blood brain barrier. And they'll say, look, there's barrier dysfunction. These guys may say, wow, there's you know problems with, they, they may be changed in their elevation. There's gonna be problems with growth. Like you see this person right here, they're just a little bit off. I'm kind of concerned about their brain-derived neurotropic factor. Uh, it did go up though from 5.6 to 9.1. Obviously, if you see that, you're gonna be very excited and say, hey, your brain has a chance of living a whole lot longer. So as we look at this, and I'll call this uh, you know, fat 
and this is a you know a certain type of gl uh, glial protein um we'll go back right here well actually we'll go forward there's this uh in particular <clears throat> this gene and this enzyme of this fibrillary protein comes through and its process is polymerization and depolymerization and it goes all the way down and basically at the end of the day its one job is to actually create neuroactive substances and internal neuronal interactions so that you can have excitability because remember i already showed you the structure now we have to have excitability of that neuron and in other words we have to charge it and that's what this is for this spills out very easily and then if the blood-brain barrier is damaged it crosses the blood-brain barrier so this is one of the this is even more sensitive than s100b as far as blood-brain barrier um <clears throat> so when you look at this and, and this is your again you, you know gfap is what i call it but it's, it's a glial uh fibrillary acidic protein okay so again it's related let, let me just break the words down here it's in glial cells fibrillary it's talking about its ph and it's a protein okay so look at this um you know it's in human serum less than four hours after a stroke cerebral ischemia 24 to 72 hours severe tbi six to 24 hours mild tbi less than 24 hours you can check all of these things within a day and the thing that's interesting is this gfap it really goes in and again i told you it gives you excitability but if there's brain injury and it spills outside a glial cell and goes out into the interstitial fluid and then diffuses down and goes to the blood brain barrier very easily and then can be picked up on a test. So, bam, there's been damage. Is brain derived neurotropic factor changing? Is enolase changing? And is the barrier damaged? Because now you see what was in here creating excitability. Is it out here? And by the way, if it's not in here creating excitability, if you have a loss of excitability and neurotropic factors, that's a double screw. So this is just something that you really want to look. Typically, this is cleared out through the lymphatic system as most things, but it can actually cross over. So I kind of I put you down a nice little reference here. This is a good paper for you to look at if anybody wants to read about it a little bit more. So neurofilament light. So I just showed you something that excites. Now, neurofilament light is a lot like some of the other components like enolase for instance but neurofilament light helps a lot with neurofilaments <laughs> but whenever we have damage now not to just the soma but actually to the axonal component then we might get a lot of neurofilaments okay now it's very easy to tag these guys as you know an antibody so that happens quite a bit. You'll see neurofilament light antibodies and axonal damage with destruction of neuron membranes, releases of neurofilaments, tau microfilaments into the blood. Okay, these guys go across the blood brain barrier fairly easily. Um, when you look at this, you know, activated microglia, you know, they result in secretion of tropic factors. Um, but this right here is a, is a bad deal because that means that you've damaged not only the soma, but you may have damaged an axon. All right. And so it's just showing you one other component that if it busts open, it leaks out and can be measured. Cell body, it breaks and gets damaged. It comes out and can be measured like on the last slide. And there's always phagocytic cells like T cells and B cells waiting around to make antibodies to this stuff. That's why we don't like it to be up and outside of the cell for a long period of time because your body sees it as debris and it goes boom and it tags it. 
All right. So anyway, pretty cool stuff. Uh, the microglial cells, they're always going to activate. And if you activate them enough, they'll start to change their class. And once you change their class, they can actually become phagocytic or stay on or really wreak havoc for a long period of time, possibly forever. This is, again, just a slide that's not that great. Sorry, but I, I, I put it on here just to show you, um, you know, neurofilament light protein. And it's really coming from a breakdown of axons going into the blood and, and being measured. So, again, it's a, it's a barrier component that I think is uh, pretty cool. So, this is S100B. This is the one that really started the whole revolution of is the blood brain barrier intact? Okay, so if you have low extracellular concentrations of, of this, you're going to have long term potentiation, which is great, neuride extension, which is great, differentiation, which is great, and plasticity, which is great. And if nothing is really damaged and the levels are low, and TNF alpha, which is what really goes over and breaks open the blood brain barrier. Okay, then there's not a lot of S100B to measure. Okay, there's not a lot of neurofibrillary uh, components or GFAT to measure either. And if it's looking this good, there's probably brain derived neurotropic factors and the intracellular mechanisms through enolase are probably there. So this right here, pretty cool. Hopefully, we're all right here. You can only do this through nutrition and exercise and lifestyle. There's really not any medications that make all this happen. I mean, if you get into a crisis, obviously there is. Now, if things go wrong, okay, um, and the astrocytes get activated um, and we start making tumor necrosis factor and inflammatory cytokines, they're going to start releasing S100B. Okay, and I want you to understand that, you know, astrocytes are kind of the guardians of the uh, blood brain barrier, but they also, this will impair oligodendrocytes, which can cause some demyelination or white matter disease. You can see on MRI, and it can cause other cells again to create microglial activation and reactive oxygen species and eventually apoptosis. And once that happens, of course, everything else falls out you know, neurofilament light, GFAT, S100B. Do I have enough brain-derived neurotropic factor to actually make this thing work? And do I have enough enolase to make it kind of work and recover? Or if this is completely dead, do I have the ability to clean this out appropriately and not make an immune response to it, especially to its DNA? So S100B means if you've got damage, it's up. If you've got damage, neurofilaments are up. If you've got damage, GFAP is up. And those can all be measured. GFAP is probably the most sensitive. S100B, not as sensitive as we thought, but still a good marker. Neurofilament, a good marker as well. GFAP, a very, very, very good marker. Okay, so anyway. As we look at this a little bit further, um, this is kind of a good slide because it summarizes a lot of things like, okay, so oligodendrocyte and S100B and astrocytes as well. Neurons, they can release glutamate for excitotoxicity. There's all kinds of things. This right here for inflammation, inflammation, and we've got to have brain-derived neurotropic factors, okay? Astrocytes, again, GFAP, S100B. In other words, sometimes when you see a certain level of some of these things, you can start to guess what cell types may be involved. Um, Brain-derived neurotropic factor even keeps the endothelium intact so that you don't have a leaky barrier, which is really kind of neat. Um, but this just really shows, you know, neural glial and neurological structural proteins and the things that we're looking at, if they rupture, then, then um, if they rupture, we're going to be able to measure some of these things and say if there's damage to a glial, you know, microglial cells, there's damage to neurons, there's damage to astrocytes, there's demyelination. You can see white matter disease, and everything starts making a little bit of sense. 
and hopefully things aren't spilled out in there long enough to where the immune system attacks it and now you got autoimmunity forever and sometimes it's pretty low and it's an IgG response and sometimes it's very high and there is an IgM response. Okay. So now we'll do some memory associated markers. So we've got uh, A beta 42 and 40. So this is really what it, the, the story of uh, Alzheimer disease has gotten a lot more complex. I'm going to read to you just a little bit here because these guys are really interesting and especially their ratios. Um, the data really corroborating right now is finding that the A42 concentration and they'll say in CSF, but also in blood is uh, reduced in the mild cognitive impairment stage of a, you know, Alzheimer's. It's already. Okay, so low A42 levels in early Alzheimer's may reflect not only sequestering meaning, you know, gathering more A42, and it may turn it into senile plaques. The presence of just A42, and see what happens is A42, we have a cell, and then we have these little spikes that come off, and then we have secretases that come off and break these into monomers. And if these monomers are cleaved by a genetically mutated secretase, it'll form oligomers, which are multiple monomers put together. And then those oligomers will turn into amyloid. So these A42 oligomers somehow might escape ELISA detection, but they don't this microarray. That's why we like this. So this process may well be a pathogenic in uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And really, it likes to go to the synaptic end, and it likes to create oligomers, which turn into tau, which turns into filibur, uh, neurofibrillary tangles, and so forth. Now, we've got A42, and we've got A40 concentrations, and uh, these A40 also is, you know, part of this whole situation it's an it's a you know a beta 42 and a beta 40 and so as you start to you know mutate this uh you know protein that comes off usually alpha secretase clips this and turns into a monomer and it's disposed of but sometimes there's complement and there's connectors and if a gamma secretase comes along and makes this you've got 42 and 40 and they can all form oligomers, okay? So A40 concentration correlates significantly, albeit weakly, weak meaning weaker, with a more rapid annual decline in the MMSE and converters to Alzheimer dementia. So you see a similar observation has been made. Uh, they did this on Japanese people in uh, Alzheimer population. So one explanation of the correlation between low A40 um, and rapid cognitive decline in patients with low A40, it may have more advanced amyloid plaque pathology in the brain that sequesters not only A42, but also A40. So now when you have A42 and A40, they start getting sequestered and they start changing into something that can become pathogenic like amyloid and oligomers. Okay. So wouldn't it be cool to be able to measure each one of these and then look at the ratio of them, which is what we're going to start to do. So it's been estimated that, uh, 42 measurement is useful in really classification of 87% of subjects. So that's why we just like to look at the uh, 42 by itself, 87% of subjects. When non-Alzheimer de uh, dementia patients and non-demented uh, individuals were compared, it is also suggested that when you look at this 42, it's an early indicator of silent amyloidosis. 
So when you look at 42, and that's this measurement, and then you look at things like brain derived neurotropic factor and it's low and enolase is low. And then you've got systemic inflammation and gut problems. You can start to say to yourself, is this person getting early mild cognitive impairment? I mean, this is right out of a paper. And when I read this and I, you know, and I was going through this and I was learning this, I was like, this biomarker, it, it could change a lot. Um, it could change a lot in the way we see brains. As a matter of fact, it's scary. I don't even want to do it to myself um, because you're like, oh God, what if it's positive? But a, but the 40 as an alone biomarker is not promising as an, as an Alzheimer's disease biomarker. Now, I told you that 42 is, and I told you that 40 is not as much. That's why we look at them separately, okay? There is currently no doubt that CS have concentration ratios of 42 to 40 is superior to 42 alone. Okay. So when we look at the ratios, um, man, when you have 42 and 40 that are both misbehaving, it, it, it really screws things up. So several studies have shown that there's accuracy when comparing 40, uh, B42 alone uh, with other biomarkers like 40. So really, here it is, 42 and 40. 40 really helps compensate for abnormally high or low amyloid beta or you know your, your, your beta levels, therefore normalizing uh, individual variability. So what we're finding is this. There can't be much of a skew and there can't be really abnormal levels of one, especially 42. So when you look at this, this is just kind of a easy slide to look at. When you look at low B1 or 42, and then you look at the 42 to 40 ratio. Remember I told you 42 is a much better early indicator 42, not as much, but if it's there by itself and it's low, it's not good. It's more long-term stuff. But if both of these are low, you're getting plaques that are bad. Now, the test also has the ability to measure total tau. Okay. And when you start losing energy, and you start spilling ATP and phosphorus or phos, it'll, it'll phosphorylate tau. And phosphorylated tau turns into death. Okay. The neurofibrillary tangle inside destroys it. So you don't have good communicating mechanisms and so forth. So this is your hyperphosphorylated tau. So when you look at this, you can say, is it just 42 and 40 is okay? What is the ratio? And is it within the normal limits? Because if the ratio is off and then 42 is off, then you've got yourself a real problem where you're probably saying, I've got some mutated secretases here. And this is really right out of clinical significance of fluid biomarkers. And they, these biomarkers are being done in Alzheimer's disease. They're trying to figure out what's going to happen. So this is really a cool slide to me. So when you look at this, um, you've got beta alpha secretase, okay? And then you've got different types of secretases here. And then you've got your A beta 42. So this is a moment in time where there has to be a decision made. Now, everybody wants to know what apoenzymes do. Am I an apoenzyme E4, you know, E4? If that's the case, then you will not stop this mechanism of 42 from creating fibro, uh, you know, you know, fibritic uh, or really gliosis and neurotoxicity. And it will also make it to where you can't degrade and remove things off rage receptors and insulin degrading enzymes. So it just destroys brain. 
Now, apoenzyme E4, or sorry, E1, or sorry, E has another one called E1, which supports apoenzyme E. And then below that, you have another one called your trim gene. And then you have about seven of them that deal with inflammation. So in all reality, your apoenzyme is not near as powerful as some of these other ones. And if you start to add them all together, the odds ratios go up and up and up. So if I do genetic testing and then I run this test and my 42s and 40s are off and my ratio is closed, then I know that there's going to be some problems with memory and learning. And then if I look at my brain-derived neurotropic factor, my therapy doesn't have much of a chance of working. And then if I look at the spilled contents that have gone through my blood-brain barrier, I know it's been damaged and there's inflammation inside my skull. I, <clears throat> I'm giving you more than what this test offers. I, I hope that everybody is really seeing it and understanding it and saying, wow, there's a lot to this. This is pretty cool. If we just sit down and just put a few things together. So I'll get going pretty quick here. Here's a mutated gamma secretase, okay? And here's my 40, and here's my 42 monomers. And they end up creating tetramers, trimers, dimers, oligomers. But the bottom line is, this is where we end up getting everything stuck together and it turns into amyloid plaque. Okay, otherwise, if we have normal secretase, it just turns into basically a monomer. But we also know this, there's all kinds of complement that can be stuck on the membrane. And complement will attract phagocytic cells over to it and start an immunological reaction. So there can be problems on both. Again, this is looking at uh, the 40 the 42 aggregation um, and causing neuroinflammation, oxidative stress and neurological death and microglial activation and so forth. This is another really great, great paper that would be good to read. And it'll be neat because we'll start doing some of these uh, classes where we'll put this test together with the other tests and people will again, start to see how they grow together. So if you look right here, here's your gamma secretase. Now we have a 38, but we have a 40 and a 42. These guys either go out the cerebral spinal fluid or the blood. There's no oligomers made. We have good synaptic transmission and good neurological function. If there's a disease process, okay? And now these proteins, because of a mutated secretase and changes here, we get misfolded proteins. And those misfolded proteins turn into oligomers and the monomers go away. The monomers can be just really ejected very easily. And now we get neuronal death. So that's why we're measuring this 40 and 42. And these turn into tau and tau turns into all these problems. That's why we're measuring total tau. Down here, um, if this pathway is normalized, maybe because we have something that will change oxidative stress, that the oligomers will go down and now we don't have dysfunction. But at the end of the day, if the beta amyloid dis, uh, dysfunction, if this hypothesis worsens because maybe you have an infection or maybe you have inflammation or maybe you have autoimmunity, plus you have these other findings, this keeps going and going and going and you get more and more misfolding and the synaptic deficits just get so bad that the brain starts to just come apart. And that's really what uh, Alzheimer's is. So what happens is you have a cell here and a cell here, and now you can't connect the two. And if you can't connect the two, you lose energy, or sorry, you lose the, the generation, the brain-derived neurotropic factor connection between the two and the action potentiation between the two, and these die. And eventually, if enough die, you used to have a brain that looked like this, but now you've got a brain that looks like this. In other words, cortical volume loss. So when we look at total tau, we measure it, and it's pretty cool because total tau really is 
kind of the end of the story of everything we just told you about the beta 42 and the beta 42 to 40 ratio. Um, and it reflects the aggregation and deposition of proteins in the brain. And we know that 40 is the most abundant variant of AB. But when you have all this, you may get some tau. Tau can destroy this. We can end up getting tangles that damage the synaptic cleft. If you phosphorylate it, um, you get the tangles, okay? Whereas, remember, um, if you go up here and you look at just total tau, it's not disease-specific. It's going to turn into one of these. It'll probably phosphorylate and end up turning into tangles. If you've ever seen the show Hoarders, there's just stuff everywhere. You can't even get it around it. That's what ends up happening to the neuron. It's almost like a hoarder. And then you get a neural gland, and it's a synaptic protein, dendritic spines. They start to really become screwed up. So now your synaptic cleft, your synaptic spine, your axial, axonal projection, and the soma all break down because there was a mutation in a secretase. 41 and 42 decided to make weird oligomers that turned into amyloid that turned into all of the stuff that you see on the screen, and we can measure this total tau. Really awesome. And if all this happens, and I put a lot of stuff on here, but if you end up getting these oligomers and we end up getting amyloid, it can make an inflammasome, which can cause damage. It can end up causing apoptosis. We can get aggregation, which turns into tangles. There's a lot of things that can happen other than just an Alzheimer component. It creates all kinds of autophagy, lysosomal damage, protein degradation, and so forth. So we're rounding, rounding out here. Um, this is kind of all. There's so many places we could start, but you know, when you look at this. Um, denatured or folded ensembles or proteins uh, we can end up getting amyloid right here inclusion body uh, which can be signs of you know intracellular damage you can see it under microscopy neurofibrils you can see them under microscopy these oligomers can turn into things that shouldn't be inside um, and then disordered aggregates, which are really proteins that the body doesn't understand. So it, it does quite a bit more than just Alzheimer's. Is, I'm just going to say it's pretty complex. Now, um, let's just talk about synuclein, which is the end. Here's the interesting thing. What we're finding is information is going into the system and going up to the brain and creating problems like a leaky gut, inflammation. That's why I showed you earlier that all of this stuff creates inflammation. So when we have a barrier system breach here, we may have a barrier system breach here. So who's to say that through the vagus and through the vasculature that we're not getting neurological problems since the majority of inflammation and 80% of our immune system is in our guts. It has to be because that's what we eat. And well, you know, your best friend's son walks in and he's eating a cockroach, you, you want him to have a great immune system. That's a real story. So when we have this, alpha synuclein is really, it's a protein that's used in various neurons that create motor function. That's why Parkinson disease, when you have alpha synucleinopathies, those damage cells that make dopamine you don't make the dopamine and therefore you reduce the amount of activation that goes to the basal ganglionic striatum and you can't activate movement even though the brain is saying go okay so alpha synuclein is something that we see <clears throat> inside of cells especially cells that deal with movement but we don't see it spilled out and we don't see it damaged or you know changed um it gives us the ability to have you know excitability and so forth that's appropriate for movement 
So whenever we have alpha synucleinopathies, we end up getting Lewy bodies, which really uh, is, is pretty interesting, Lewy body dementia. We know some famous actors that have passed away from that. And these are people that have, looks like Parkinson's disease, but they get dementia. And then they start hallucinating and they may get violent. Um, there's a version of this that just causes mitochondrial damage. So now your ability to make energy goes down, okay? And then, of course, there's one that makes the inside of the cell become damaged. This is maybe the one right here that is more responsive to intracellular glutathione, or sorry, intravenous glutathione. This is a different genetic variety, and this is a different genetic variety. These are Parkin and pink DNA types of components. So really here in the end, you know, disaggregation of uh, alpha synuclein. So, you know, things break apart, you know, and then we end up getting toxicity and then we end up getting transmission. And it creates, you know, this alpha synuclein monomer and this dis or disaggregation of machinery and the prion like propagation of alpha synucleinopathy, it starts to aggregate. And anytime that this is not working correctly intracellularly in motor neurons, the biggest thing is we get toxicity, intracellular machinery is inappropriate, and then the ability for that neuron to do what it's supposed to do, which is make dopaminergic projections to things like the limbic system, the neostriatum, and even to the orbital frontal lobe fails, and we end up getting anything from addiction to movement disorders. So anyway, that's pretty much what we're looking at here. So just to kind of summarize real quick, we have our new test that I just showed you. We have our neural zoomer plus test that I just showed you and our, and our, you know, our neurotransmitter test. And then we have, I really like, you know, the intracellular, extracellular um, nutrient tests that are really good about telling you, hey, look, you need this nutrition, but it can be other tests too. Like I've got a lot of people with mold and I want to see if it's doing some of this or if it's Lyme and this is going on and uh, is it gut and is this going on? And you can start to put together a picture and mend it together almost like a quilt. And pretty soon there'll be enough tests to where you can make a quilt that is really pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So anyway, I appreciate the time. I went a little bit long. I'm always long winded, but I wanted to make sure that I kind of get across not just what the test is kind of looking at, but also how it congeals with the rest of the others. Awesome. Dr. Brock, that was such a wonderful presentation, and I'm sure we all learned so much about multiple tests from this. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. And now, first of all, we're going to get into just a few questions, if that's all right with you. Oh, no, that's fine. Perfect. And before we do that, I do just want to note that this is being recorded and it will be available on our provider portal in just a few business days. So you will be able to rewatch it. And now first, let's see, what kind of exercise best supports BDNF? Um, I would say interval exercise. I, there has to be something that is up and down and up and down and up and down. I, I don't think that, I mean, I think that going on a walk is good for a lot of people. It depends on what your body's able to tolerate movement and joint mechanoreceptor activation and muscle spindle activation activates the brain. Mm -hmm. Now we could tie in what's best for muscle mass, what's best for cardiovascular function, but movement in general, it, it's this receptor-based activation is the best thing for BDNF. So that the answer is whatever your body can tolerate and whatever you're willing to do. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And another question asks if you would suggest doing the neural health panel without the neural zoomer plus or combining both. Well, I mean, I think that there's times that you could, can definitely do it by itself, but I think that what may happen and this is going to, this is my uh, concern is that a lot of people are going to get information and they're going to be, they're going to want to know what's on two or three other tests. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, and we cannot put every single thing on one test. It's just not possible, feasible, or even doable. But we can clump certain groups of tests together to give us a picture. And, I, and I'm hoping that clinicians will become good enough to know how to do that. I mean, yes, I think this test can stand alone 100%, especially if I'm like, look, I'm trying to make your brain, you know, a little more healthy, not have as much brain fog, and it be able to connect a little bit more, and you be more with it. Or are you going to have memory decline and so forth? You can definitely use this. The Neural Zoomer Plus is definitely more mystifying in regards to the directions that it can go. Definitely. Okay. And now speaking of cognitive decline, um, someone asks, what grouping of tests would you recommend then for cognitive decline? If well, what we just, I mean, are the, uh, I mean, a neuropsychiatric battery and of course a physical exam. Okay. Um, a good old fashioned MRI is good because it'll show if there's volume loss. Um, the, you know, of course the test that we just looked at right here would be really, really nice. And then, you know, you can always correlate that with the neural, neural zoomer plus, but you can also go back and if you're wanting to kind of maybe find out what some of the other things are, you can run your traditional labs. Like, is there insulin resistance? Is there diabetes? Is there anemia? Is there some sort of other, you know, infection? Does the patient have a bad gut? Have they been allergic to foods forever? Have they had traumatic brain injury? You can really go through quite a bit. That's why the history, I think, is so absolutely important before you start doing these. And then realize that when you do these tests, do them, do them sterile, meaning don't make it to where um, they're taking a lot of other drugs like prednisones and other things that can maybe possibly skew results. Okay, perfect. And then the last question is, can you speak to peripheral neuropathy etiology and advanced testing? Yeah, well, I, broad. I don't want to be here for three hours. <laughs> peripheral neuropathy, you got to understand there can be a mononeuropathy entrapment. There can be a polyneuropathy. The polyneuropathy can be small or large fiber. Okay. It can be axon or myelin. It can be really, they're almost all distal, but some can be proximal. You know, there can be toxic neuropathies. There can be, there, there's so many different causes of neuropathic symptomatology. Will this test necessarily give you the information that you want? I don't know. I would rather look at antibodies and some of my other traditional labs for peripheral components. You know, do they have, di do they have diabetes, thyroid problems? You know, God forbid they have leprosy or something like that. You know, this is more really central nervous system and memory but some of your myelin basic proteins and so forth, your humulin and, you know, your yo and so forth can be uh, peripheral. <clears throat> and remember that you can also have inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. N never roll out diabetes, guys. Always look at your C-peptides and your hemoglobin A1C and compare that to glucose and so forth and see what you get. Perfect. So I, I wish I could give a better answer, but I mean, we could definitely sit down and talk about, you know, peripheral neuropathy all day long. It's probably the reason why I got into neurology in the first place, but it's a long conversation. I don't think there's any one test that can define peripheral neuropathy. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you again so much. That was so informative and yeah, we can't wait to continue learning from you and uh, working with you further. Well, thank you. And I'm very thankful for everybody that, you know, took time out of their afternoon to sit here and, and listen to me, you know, jabber about neurology, but your what you learn and the way you apply these things will change people. And you can really grab a brain and find a brain before it becomes too late and maybe, you know, maybe redirect it and, and give them a chance. Maybe you give them an extra decade, maybe you give them an extra five years. I, I don't know. We don't really have a way of knowing that, but anyway, it's just, I just want to say, thanks. It, it, it makes it to where if I tell you something and you help somebody and that helps other people, then this is all worth it for me. Definitely. That's great. Well, thank you again. And thank you everyone for tuning in and have a good rest of your night. All right. Thank you.